In this video, I'm gonna be talking about the newest car from one of the newest car brands in the world, the Polestar 2 from Polestar. If this looks oddly familiar, that's because this general design first landed as the Volvo 40.2 concept about four years ago. Since then, however, Volvo and Volvo's parent company, Geely, decided to spin Polestar off as a full electric sub-brand and as sort of a tech incubator for the Volvo brand as well. New technologies are gonna happen on Polestar vehicles first. That's where people that want the absolute latest cutting edge technology should go. And some point later, those technologies will end up on new Volvo vehicles as well. A good example of this is the Google infotainment system that we see on the inside of the Polestar 2. That's gonna be working its way across the Volvo lineup at some point, but it landed in this vehicle first. One of the key things to know about Polestar is that even though this is a new brand, it's not really a startup because it has the full backing of Volvo and their parent company. And as a result, this is built like a regular car that comes off a production line. If you've been a subscriber for a while, you'll know that this is not the first time I've been able to get my hands on keys to the Polestar 2, but rather unfortunately, that last time was a bit of a disaster. I had only about four to five hours with the vehicle. I was trying to shoot two vehicles, one for myself and one for my friends over at TFL Car, and right in the middle of everything, there was an absolutely massive forest fire in Northern California that put all the plans upside down. This time, I've been able to spend three days with this Polestar 2, and I've been able to completely discharge its battery pack twice, so we're certainly going to be talking talking about range, and we're gonna be talking about performance figures because there have been software updates that have improved the performance of the Polestar 2 since this first launched only about a few months ago. That noise you hear is the pedestrian warning noise for the Polestar 2. Putting this in neutral and leaving it on with the parking brake engaged is the only way to keep the headlights on because this employs a system very similar to modern Teslas where there's no on off button for the car. You simply hop in, put your foot on the brake, put it in drive, and then drive away. And when you wanna park the car, you simply hit the P button, then leave the car and it turns itself off. One of the things that I find really refreshing about Polestar is that they're not running away from their Volvo heritage and their Volvo DNA. In fact, they're really embracing it. When you take a look at a lot of their product literature and of course talk to their PR people, they're really upfront that this started its life as a Volvo and the brand started its life as a Volvo as well. So certainly there are gonna be some Volvo styling components up front like these Thor's hammer headlights, but there's a lot of Polestar specific tech going on here like these new matrix pixel LED headlights. These are not found in any Volvo vehicle, although we will find them in later models. Now, rather unfortunately, in the United States, we have absolutely idiotic headlight laws, so these are not allowed to do their thing here. If lighting laws change, that can be enabled via an over-the-air update. The Polestar 2 is fully updatable, just like modern Teslas. We also have LED fog lights down below. One is not burnt out. It's just that when we have the turn signal on, like you see over there, it's also used as a cornering light. So if I turn this turn signal on, this one would turn on as well. And of course, if I turn the fog lights on, they'd both be on. According to Polestar, the next generation of their product line will look definitely more distinctively Polestar and less Volvo-like. We certainly see that in the upcoming Polestar 3. That's gonna be the SUV that we're gonna see right around a year from now. I've already mentioned the elephant in the room, the Tesla Model 3, but you could logically consider this a competitor to something like the Ford Mustang Mach-E as well, because this is not actually a sedan, even though it sort of looks like it from this angle. This is a liftback, more like the Tesla Model S. The boxy profile is really obvious when we move all the way around to the side. That helps this be a little bit more practical in terms of its interior accommodations than its exterior size would otherwise indicate. At 181.4 inches long, this is six inches shorter than a Volvo S60, which is considered a compact luxury car in the United States. This is one inch shorter than a Honda Civic. So if you were thinking that this might end up being sort of Toyota Camry sized, Think again, this is still on the smaller side of things. If you want a bigger electric sedan, you're gonna have to go somewhere else. This is about three inches shorter than the Tesla Model 3, but its wheelbase is five and a half inches shorter than the S60 or Model 3. That's the distance between the rear axle and the front axle. The result of that is a much more upright seating position inside because Polestar wanted to give us legroom and headroom figures that were very competitive. So instead of being a little bit more relaxed like you find in some sedans, you're actually a little bit more upright in here, which is basically the same sort of thing that we find in the Mustang. I mentioned the Ford because in a way I'm surprised that Polestar didn't try to call this a crossover. With 5.9 inches of ground clearance, this actually has more ground clearance than the Ford Mustang crossover. And it's really not that far off the Tesla Model Y. The Model Y has a little bit more than half an inch of extra clearance. So this is somewhere between the Tesla Model 3 at 5.5 inches and the Model Y at 6.6 .6 inches. It seems obvious that the designers were really prioritizing rear seat headroom and cargo practicality with this design. The very horizontal 
vertical roof line and the very boxy proportions really maximize rear seat headroom. And then this lift back design rather than a traditional trunk really improves cargo practicality. You'll also notice how high off the ground this rear hatch really is. That gives us a larger and boxier area than you'd find in some of those low slung sedans that you might be comparing this to. We have full LED tail lamp modules out back, including amber LED turn signals. That's certainly my preference. There are also some LED fog lights down there at the bottom. And the design sort of reminds me a little bit of a cross between perhaps Lincoln and Volvo. A big advantage for Polestar is that they have access to all of Volvo's active driver assistance technologies and active safety technologies as well. And it seems like in the future we may see more of those systems launching in Polestar models before they're launched in Volvo models. But at the moment, this has basically everything that we see in the Volvo lineup on it. Adaptive cruise control with their aggressive steering and lane centering system, pedestrian detection, cyclist detection, large animal detection and obstacle avoidance with steering intervention as well. So if this vehicle feels that steering Steering out of the way of the obstacle is the right thing to do. It will do that even when the adaptive cruise control and the semi-autonomous driving systems are not engaged. Under the hood, there's not much to see because the motors and the battery are very low slung in the vehicle. There's just about enough storage room here in this front cargo area to put the charge cord that the vehicle comes with. It does come with a level one and level two capable charge cord, which is a really handy touch. At the moment, there's just one powertrain option in the Polestar 2. It's a dual motor setup. Each motor is capable of 204 horsepower and 243 pound-feet of torque, giving this 408 horsepower total. Those motors are mated to single-speed gearboxes, one in the front and one in the rear, and connected to a 78 kilowatt-hour battery pack. Polestar doesn't give exact specifications, but by my estimation, about 74 kilowatt hours of this pack are actually usable. According to the EPA, that will give you 233 miles of range at about approximately 3.1 miles per kilowatt hour. Included with every Polestar 2 is this sort of hourglass shaped EVSE. This is a dual voltage model, so it will operate either on 240 volts right there, that's a modern dryer plug right there. With this end and the appropriate power source, you'll be able to give the car 9.6 kilowatts maximum. There's also an interchangeable end, so I can simply pull this off and then pop on this 100 10 volt cable. This is the pretty standard outlet you'll find in every garage out there. That will give the vehicle 1.4 kilowatts. The onboard charger is capable of a maximum 11 kilowatt charge, but for that you're going to need to install a different EVSE. Behind door number one on the driver's side is a standard CCS charge connector. The J1772 connector on top will give you that maximum 11 kilowatt AC charge, and then the two pins on the bottom will give you up to a 150 kilowatt DC fast charge. Depending on conditions, you can expect this vehicle to charge between 130 and 150 kilowatts. As always, charge times will vary based on the equipment and the kind of power you have available to you. If you are near one of the newer DC fast charge stations that have high output abilities, you can go from 0 to 80% capacity in about 45 minutes. I was able to verify that with this exact vehicle next to me. If you have access to an 11 kilowatt EVSE, that's not going to be the one included with the vehicle. This one maxes out again at 9.6 kilowatts. Then you could gain range at around 30 miles per hour. If for some reason your Polestar was completely empty, it would take a little over eight hours to to get this vehicle from completely empty to completely full on that 11 kilowatt EVSE. If you have access only to a 110 volt level one EVSE, obviously it's gonna take several days to fill this vehicle up if it's completely empty. If you live in a colder climate, heating the cabin and heating the battery are going to have a big impact on your real world range. And that's why a number of EV manufacturers are moving away from resistive element heaters and towards heat pumps. Rather, unfortunately, the Polestar 2 at the moment does not have a heat pump available. But the rumor mill says that one should be available soon because it is going to be an option on the XC40 EV, which is again very closely related to the Polestar 2. It's worth noting that you will not find a heat pump on the Ford Mustang Mach-E, but you do find one on the Jaguar I-Pace. Front seat comfort in this model is excellent, although to be honest, I found the seats in the Tesla Model 3 just a little bit more comfortable for my body shape, but the Model 3 does not have an extending thigh cushion like we find in this particular seat design. These seats are very similar to the ones in the XC40. We have a four-way adjustable lumbar support, a two-position memory over there on the door, and the passenger seat has the same range of motion as the driver's seat, including that thigh cushion extension. We have a manual tilt telescopic steering column rather than a power steering column. That's something that we also see in Volvos today.
Hopping into the back seat, the first thing you'll notice is that we have a lot of headroom back here. At 39.8 inches of rear headroom, this is actually a little bit more than the Mach-E or the Tesla Model Y. But legroom is certainly lower than the Model 3 or the Mach-E. This has about 2 inches less legroom than the Model 3 and 5 inches less legroom than the Ford. Now over here on the driver's side, that's not a problem for me. I can very easily adjust that front seat comfortably for me and still have about 3 inches of legroom left. But if I try and scoot over to the right side of the car, the footwell is definitely a little tight and my knees are definitely digging right into that seat back. This is all the way back in its tracks. Helping improve headroom front and rear is a trick that we see in the Tesla Model 3 as well. This all glass moonroof is standard in all models and it definitely gives you a bit more headroom available than you'd find in a steel roof. On the other hand, we don't have a shade for this just like we see in the Tesla lineup. Cargo capacity and cargo practicality are certainly a reason to get the Polestar 2 over something like the Model 3. Behind this lift back, we find 14 cubic feet of storage space. Now, the way that Polestar is calculating this cargo figure seems a little bit odd because by my measurements, it looks like they're not including the underfloor storage area or the area above this cargo divider. And since this is a lift back, obviously this space is available to you because you can just remove this from the vehicle, pile your cargo up a little bit higher. And if you wanted to remove the load floor, you could also stuff some extra things in there as well. By my measurements in terms of total cargo capacity, this is ahead of the Tesla Model 3, but keep in mind that the front cargo area is considerably smaller than the Model 3. And this is where we find a fairly small watertight cargo area, again, big enough to hold the EVSE. This is again, the one that comes with the vehicle. And if I lift this out of the way, we can pull this out. And this is where we find the can of fix a flat, the tire iron and the tow hook. If you didn't want to have the cargo divider in here, and honestly, it is a little strangely shaped with this sort of large nose section right here, I would probably leave that out. And then you could put the EVSE and some small items right here up front. Thanks to the generously sized hatch and the practical cargo touches in here, I'm gonna give this eight out of 10 points in my exclusive trunk comfort index. We obviously lose points because we don't have a full size spare tire, but I also have to deduct a few points because of this hard cargo cover. This is a lot less convenient than a roller style shade because if you wanted to put larger cargo in here, you'd have to find somewhere to put this. We do, however, have a power hatch. Now let's go for a spin around the interior. The first thing you're obviously going to notice is this enormous sheet of glass in the ceiling. It goes all the way from the front seats to just over the rear passenger's heads, but you notice it does have a slight bump inwards right there over the middle rear passenger seat, and that's why headroom is a little bit more limited in that area than it is in the outboard seating positions. The front seats have height adjustable headrests and height adjustable shoulder belts. The upholstery has a very modern feel to it. This is a blend of fabric inserts on the outboard sections, some imitation suede inserts right there, and some material in the middle that sort of feels like a wetsuit. As we move on over to the front door panels, we find definitely some Volvo parts starting here. So Volvo window switches and door pulls right there, but the style's quite different here. We find more fabric going on, some of the same materials that we found on the seats, soft touch plastics on the upper section, and then we start getting some real wood trim as we move on over to the dashboard. There are a few different colors available in this interior. This is the darkest one, which is not my preference. I kind of prefer the honey colored interior a little bit more. We have real wood trim right there, some ambient lighting. This is not color adjustable, which did surprise me. And then fabric inserts right there on the dashboard as well. Some large horizontal air vents all around for the driver and passenger. You'll find basically an identical one on the driver's side. The bulk of the dashboard is made from a soft touch injection molded material. And then right above the infotainment system, we have a large center channel speaker and then two large air vents right there. I found those air vents just a little bit high. I kind of wish they'd been a little bit lower in the dashboard. Below that, we find a large portrait orientation LCD that's a world first, not because of the touchscreen, but because of the software that it's running. This is running the Google operating system for cars. This is exactly the same infotainment software that we'll find in forthcoming Polestar models. It's a variant of the software that we'll see in upcoming Volvo models and likely pretty similar to what we'll see in Fords because Ford recently inked a deal with Google to run the same OS in new Fords. At the bottom of the screen, there's a physical home button that takes you to this particular look. You can also get a very similar look hitting that little button right there and you can see the individual apps that the system is capable of having. At some point later, there will be more apps available for this system, but unfortunately there aren't so many available now. If I hit this little button right here, you can see uh, all the apps that are available. There are a number of different apps, but 
It, we don't have integrated ways or anything like that here just yet. I would hope that once we see the Google OS in more vehicles out there, we would start getting a few more apps available in the system, including some of those alternative mapping interfaces. Now, at this point in time, there is no Apple CarPlay integration in the system, but we're told that that will happen via an over-the-air update sometime later this year. So even people that buy an early generation Polestar 2 will be able to get Apple CarPlay at some point later. At the moment, we simply have a Bluetooth interface. Below the screen, we have a Qi wireless charging mat, a small storage area there, two USB-C charge ports. One will interface with the system. That's where we'd plug CarPlay in, it looks like. The other one definitely supplies enough power to charge iPads or other tablet computers. Below that, we find some physical buttons for the infotainment system, a play pause button, defogger and defroster. Those are nice to have as direct access buttons. And then the hazard lights right there. We have a shifter that operates similar to what we see in other Volvos, but you'll notice there's no power button. So I simply put my foot on the brake, double tap it down for drive, or double tap it forward for reverse, and that turns the car on. Park is that button right there, and we have a little Polestar logo right inside. Speaking of logos, if we go back up to the ceiling between the front seats, you'll notice we have a little Polestar logo there, but it's not etched into the glass. It's actually being reflected off the glass. It's projected via a little module in this section. The trim panel around the shifter has sort of a U shape. You can see we have ambient lighting in there, real wood trim, sort of a rubbery texture on this section of the center console, and then a single cup holder right here. The cup holder arrangement in the Polestar 2 strikes me as unusual for a car being sold in North America because there is a second cup holder right here under the center armrest, but I find its location horribly inconvenient. There's a very small storage area right up front, and of course you can remove this. We simply click some tabs there and then remove it from the car, and then we have access to a small storage area, but then we only have one cup holder. There's an additional storage area on either side of the center console, but I do find that cup holder arrangement particularly vexing. Let me know what you think about that down there in the comment section. On the driver's side, we find a full LCD instrument cluster, which is definitely different than we find in the Model 3, and also larger than the one in the Mustang Mach-E. The Mach-E takes a very minimalist approach to the screen on the driver's side. As you can see, this system offers a full mapping interface, very similar to the one that we see in the infotainment system, and there are three basic layouts for the display. I like the fact that this display is crisp and easy to read, but I do wish it gave us a little bit more info. On the right side, we could pull up a trip computer readout. You can see our fuel economy and uh, distances, etc. Keep in mind on this trip auto section, we haven't actually been moving very much. This has just been today's filming. The steering wheel is essentially the same as the one that we find in the XC40. No paddles on the back. I do wish it had regen paddles. That would be a nice touch. On the left side, we find the controls for the adaptive cruise control system. These side-to-side -side buttons allow you to change modes, whether you want adaptive cruise control or that pilot assist system. Then we have the distance increase and decrease buttons over here. On this side, we find volume up, down, track, forward, backward. This also interacts with that trip computer display. You can see you can pull it up right there. And then this button changes the display view of that LCD instrument cluster. There's a voice command button on top. In a normal vehicle, it might go without saying, but in EV, sometimes it doesn't. Over here, we have a turn signal stock with the headlight controls, fog light controls, and rear fog light controls. And then on the right side of the steering wheel, we have controls for the windshield wiper, including the rain sensing functionality. Let's take a quick peek at the mapping interface because I get a lot of questions about this. This is driven by Google Maps, so actually the same basic mapping interface that Tesla pulls a lot of their data from as far as the map goes. You can add charging stops. It'll do that automatically. It'll tell you where you need to stop and how long you'll need to charge along the way. In that respect, this is quite similar to what we see in modern Teslas, and it will tell you your estimated charge by the time you get there. So 33% by the time we get to that particular station. Right now we're at 70%, 32% by the time we move to that one, 15% by the time we get to that other one, and it'll require a 55-minute charge. And then we'll uh, arrive in Los Angeles at 27% there, and the time includes charging. So it says it's going to be a 7-hour, 37-minute route there. Now, because the range in this vehicle is lower than the Tesla Model 3 long range, obviously it's going to need a few more charging stops. A really nice touch with this system is how snappy it is. It's definitely very responsive. The animations are a lot quicker than most of the systems out there. It feels actually quite Tesla-like. And the range estimates upon arrival here seem to be very realistic. In fact, perhaps sometimes a little pessimistic. So generally speaking, I've arrived at a destination with a little bit more charge than the infotainment system would otherwise indicate. As with Google mapping on your phone or computer, it'll give us alternate routes, which is definitely a handy touch. You can also choose route preferences there, avoid highways, tolls, ferries, that sort of thing. And you can choose whether you want directions, traffic alerts only, or the system completely muted. Let's talk about the number that everybody wants to know about. Zero to 60 happened in this model in 4.05 seconds. 
that's quite a bit faster than the estimated time by Polestar and also faster than the pre-production model that I first drove a number of months ago. Polestar says that they're going to be doing over-the-air updates to this vehicle just like Tesla does with their entire lineup, so it's quite logical that performance has improved after they've tweaked a few things. Hopefully they can do the same to some of the efficiency numbers that we're seeing in the Polestar, but I'll talk about that a little bit later. Six to zero stopping distance happened in 113 feet. That's a little bit shorter than Polestar's quote of 115 feet. Also a little bit shorter than the last time I drove this as well. Describing the way this car drives in one sentence I think is actually pretty easy. Imagine if BMW were tasked to build a Tesla Model 3, but they only had access to Volvo parts. As we see in other luxury EVs, the weight balance is nearly perfect. We have 51% of the weight up front, 49% of the weight out back. Although this is a little bit heavier than a Model 3, about 400 pounds or so, but it does have slightly wider tires. Again, 245 with tires versus 235 with tires on that Model 3. So the handling is actually pretty similar to what we see in the Tesla, but the steering ratio is a little bit slower, a little bit more like the average luxury sedan. One thing that I've commented on in the past is that I find Tesla's steering ratio shows just a little bit quick. Now, before everybody blasts me down there in the comments section, I'm not talking about the weight of the steering. I'm talking about the steering ratio. That's not adjustable in the Tesla Model 3. All you can adjust is the assist. High assist, low assist, medium assist, etc. We get the same sort of settings in this vehicle, but the ratio, the number of turns lock to lock, is not as quick. So this feels a little bit less twitchy, a little bit more like the average German luxury car, to be perfectly honest. When it comes to handling, I'm absolutely going to give this an A+. This edges out the Tesla Model 3 for me in terms of the driving dynamics of the vehicle, the way the steering, the way the suspension, the way everything behaves with one another, and the fact that it doesn't have a punishing suspension in order to get that handling ability. This definitely outclasses the Ford Mustang Mach-E. One thing that I was surprised about with that Mustang is that it is a little bit heavier than this, and it has narrow tires, so you really feel that in the corners that that the drivetrain can right shacks the suspension and tires just can't cash. The suspension has a good polish to it, it just doesn't have the grip. I'm really glad that Polestar sent me the model without the performance package because that's the model that everybody was driving at the launch event, that's the model that most reviewers out there have been sampling, but it's not the model that most people will be buying. Most folks will be buying the one that I'm driving right here. You'll certainly notice the difference in the ride quality between these two vehicles. This is still certainly firm, but it's not as firm as the last Model 3 that I drove, and certainly not as firm as the Polestar 2 with the performance pack, especially when those dampers are really cranked up to their firmest setting like they were when I first drove it out here, uh, actually not too far from home. When it comes to ride quality, I'm going to give this particular model a B. This has a very Germanic feel to it when it comes to the ride quality, and as I said before, the handling as well. Back out on this paved road, the ride is well suited for daily commuting. This doesn't become upset over broken pavement, even in the corners. It has a really good polish level to it. At 50 miles an hour, I measured 71 and a half decibels in this cabin, which puts this a little ahead of the Model 3. And unlike the Model 3, it seems like wind noises are better controlled in here. Now, the reason I'm going to give cabin noise a B is because logically you could compare this against some mainstream luxury plug-in hybrids. I can see that as a valid comparison. And generally speaking, some of those are going to be quieter than this. Even if we're talking about a Volvo S60 T8, depending on the road surface, that seems to be a little bit quieter than this. And something like the Mercedes-Benz C-Class is also going to be quieter out on the road. Now it's time to tackle the subject of range and efficiency. According to the EPA, you should get 233 miles out of this vehicle. In my real world range test, I think that's going to be about 220 to 230 miles, depending on the terrain, how you're driving this, and the climate. Now let's talk about regen, because this is a topic that seems to divide EV owners and EV fans. Tesla has a fairly aggressive EV regen mode, but it does not have blended braking. So in a modern Tesla, when you put your foot on the brake pedal, it's not commanding more regen, it's commanding friction braking. So the only time you're regening is when you lift your foot off the accelerator pedal, and then the vehicle is slowing you down like this vehicle is doing right here. Now, this has that mode as well. So we have a low one pedal drive setting. It will take me to a complete stop here eventually. And five, four, three, two, one, and we're at a complete stop. And it will hold me here if I don't turn on the creep mode. You can adjust whether the vehicle is rolling forward if your foot's not on the brake pedal or not. You can turn that on and off. We also have a standard one pedal drive mode right here in this mode. So if I go back up to 35 miles an hour, this stops us much more rapidly, takes us down to that stop. I would actually say if I had passengers in the vehicle, this is stopping a little bit more aggressively than I probably would. 
Or my favorite mode here is simply one pedal drive off because I don't know about you, but my foot is perfectly capable of moving four inches across and engaging an accelerator pedal and a brake pedal separately. For some reason, there aren't too many green vehicles out there that have a true coasting mode like this. Some Volkswagen products have them. The Hyundai Nexo hydrogen vehicle has a mode like this. And some of the Hyundai and Kia hybrids and EVs have this uh, with paddles on the back of the steering wheel that can control the mode that you're in. I think that's one miss on this vehicle. I would love to have seen some regen paddles on the back of the steering wheel. So that way you could select through some various regen Gen modes, but again, I do love the fact that this has that regen off mode, the throttle lift off regen mode. And if you engage the brakes, you're gonna get obviously very aggressive regen up to the point where it starts to engage the friction brakes. Before we dive into pricing and comparisons, let's talk about how you buy a Polestar. It's gonna be a little bit different really than buying any other car in America right now. They're sort of gonna be doing direct sales, but not quite like we see with Tesla because Tesla has no dealers. You're actually buying it directly from Tesla themselves. With Polestar, it's gonna look sort of like that, but you're actually gonna be conducting the transaction through a dealer, or as Polestar is saying, a Polestar space. By the end of this year, this is where you'll be able to buy a Polestar. You'll notice that they're located mainly in metro areas. So if you're outside of that metro area, you probably want to think twice about buying a Polestar. The transaction technically happens via a franchise dealer, but you will be able to do everything online. You'll be able to buy the car online, pick your color, place the order, arrange your trade-in, arrange an in-person test drive. They'll actually bring the vehicle to you to your home in order to test drive the vehicle. And they will also handle contactless delivery of the vehicle if you choose to buy it, take away the trade-in, and then handle service appointments in a very similar fashion as well. After federal tax credit, the Polestar 2 ends up at $52,490. Definitely keep that price tag in mind as we dive into the first competitor, which has to be the Tesla Model 3. The Model 3 does not qualify for the full tax credit, but again, that may change later in 2021. We just don't know too many details yet. The Model 3 is in some ways the best competitor and in some ways the only competitor because these two vehicles are very close in size and they're also the only two sedans in this same size range. Zero to 60 times are pretty similar between these two vehicles, but the Model 3 can have an edge if the batteries are nice and warm. Range is definitely on the side of the Tesla, mainly due to the efficiency that we see in the Tesla Model 3. It is definitely more efficient than pretty much any other EV currently out on the market right now. Now, Polestar just released a software update. They say that's going to improve range in Polestar 2s. Hopefully I'll be able to get my hands on that model after the update in order to retest that. They also claim that Apple CarPlay is going to be available at some point soon on the Android infotainment system. That's gonna be one of the big differentiators between this and the Tesla Model 3 is that we have some slightly more conventional car features. Obviously there's that big screen in the dashboard, but we have an LCD instrument cluster. We have more buttons, we have air vents with little knobs in them, etc. rather than the all digital environment that we see in a modern Tesla. If you plan on taking your EV on long road trips, keep in mind that the Polestar 2 does have a shorter EV range than the Model 3. It also has slower DC fast charging. Now, unfortunately, I was not able to really test the DC fast charge rate as well as I would like because I didn't have access to the Electrify America stations when the Polestar 2 was with me. Apparently, there was a bit of a firmware snafu, so I had to use an EVgo station. It wasn't capable of perhaps charging it as fast as I would like. Obviously, there are also going to be variances in the charging network, but bottom line, the Model 3 is going to charge faster and it's going to have a longer range. So if you're really, really concerned about that 300 miles of possible range, that uh, long distance charging network, the ability to charge up a little bit faster, definitely keep that in mind. The last thing to keep in mind is that the Polestar 2 sort of falls between the all-wheel drive long-range version of the Model 3 and the performance version of the Model 3. There is, of course, also the performance version of the Polestar 2, but I'm just talking about the mainline version. Next up, we need to talk about the Ford Mustang Mach-E. I know it sounds weird to talk about a Mustang Mach-E and a Polestar 2 in the same sentence here, but the Polestar 2 actually has more ground clearance than the Mach-E. So does that make the Mach-E a sedan or a liftback or a hatchback? And does that make the Polestar 2 a crossover? I have to say when I was really looking at the specifications on the Polestar 2, I was kind of surprised that Polestar didn't try and call it a crossover. They could very easily have added some body cladding and then said, hey, it's a crossover because it's about the same height off the ground as some of the other electric crossovers that are out there on the market. Going down the specifications, you'll notice that the Mustang Mach-E is not quite as quick if we're talking about the currently available all-wheel drive version, 0 to 60. Now, the GT version is supposed to be faster 0 to 60, but you're going to sacrifice range for that. The current all-wheel drive Mach-E with the big battery pack 
theoretically can go 270 miles according to the EPA. In real world driving, you'll actually be able to get 280, 290 miles if you're really gentle on the battery pack. So that's certainly longer than the Polestar 2, but that's mainly due to the fact that it has an enormous battery. It's 98.8 kilowatt hours. And as a result, the Mustang Mach-E is fairly heavy. Not only is it heavy, it has relatively skinny tires, 225 with tires. So when it comes to handling, the Polestar 2 is an absolute win here. Pricing is honestly pretty close. The Mach-E comes in at $55,100 versus $59,990 for the Polestar 2, so they're really close in that respect. The GT will be a little bit more at $60,500, but they're claiming it will be faster than the Polestar 2, so a little bit closer to something like the Tesla Model 3 in terms of 0-60 to 60 performance, if you were to choose that Model 3 performance. I think that Ford has done a really good job of integrating modern technology in the Mach-E. The screen is a little bit bigger than the one that we find in the Polestar 2. Some don't care for the way it's integrated in the dashboard, but I don't really mind either that or the design in the Polestar 2. Now, build quality is certainly more premium in the Polestar. It feels like a luxury car. It feels like a BMW or a Mercedes or a Volvo, obviously. Whereas the Ford definitely feels like a nice Ford, but still a Ford. Honestly, it's hard to go wrong with either of these three electric vehicle options right now in America. There's certainly pros and cons to either of these three vehicles. When it comes to the luxury feel, refinement, materials quality, build quality, etc., the Polestar 2 really is the leader in this segment. When it comes to being an EV and going longer ranges and having higher efficiency, that is the Model 3 at the moment. When it comes to an inexpensive alternative, that honestly is the Mustang Mach-E. It performs quite well as far as range goes. Efficiency is certainly not where we see the Tesla Model 3 or the Tesla Model Y, but actual range is nearly 300 miles. It charges a little bit faster than I saw in the Polestar 2 in our initial testing. Again, keep in mind that it was a little bit hampered on the charging network with the Polestar 2. And Ford has implemented a few nice touches with the Mach-E that I appreciate, like the ability to not only be able to use your phone as a key, but just use your finger as a key. Type a password on the door and then a password on the infotainment system and start the vehicle. So if you're more interested in outdoor activities and you don't want to have your phone with you, you can do that in the Mustang Mach-E at the moment. And then there's, of course, the price tag. The Mach-E is less expensive. Be sure and let me know what you think about those three options down there in the comment section below. And of course, head over to AOAMerch.com because you can buy shirts right like this new design. There are some new designs out for spring of 2021. Be sure and head over there to AOAMerch.com. Find me over at Facebook, Instagram, all those other social places, and I'll see all of you next week.